my name is Eric Yu, and uh, I'm an architect, and we have a company called Eric Yu Architects. For the last couple of years, we are doing a lot about uh, sustainable projects for private clients, mainly wood architecture, and. Um, one of the quite exotic projects, I would say, is a project in Canada, in the wilderness in Canada. There's a Danish client who came to, to, to me like two years ago in love with Canada and they like to build a house out in the wilderness over there. And uh, we just got finished like two months ago. And that's quite an amazing experience to build in such a and a different environment and as you probably know Denmark is a pretty f flat country uh, and a small country and Canada is the opposite. Uh, it's a very big country and the landscape was quite dramatic and how to, to behave as a Danish architect there in this close collaboration with the client and with the local uh, craftsmen was uh, very interesting. And in fact we have to do uh, some more projects because I talked with the client about it could be fairly interesting to, with the same architect to develop new projects in similar architecture. That's a good idea, said the client, and then we are going to develop uh, some more projects. Well, what, what we're doing right now is as sustainable wood architecture because I think we have this positive global challenge that we have to change the way we consume our carbon resources. And when it comes to building an architecture, we have a great responsibility. Mm -hmm. And a very sustainable building material is wood. And uh, so therefore we, we're doing a lot in wood. And, we do uh, the first CFC certified wood house in, I think, in Europe or probably in the world, where 99% of all the wood was FSC certified wood coming from, well, from Canada, cedar wood there, but also a lot of Danish wood. Even the insulation was made of wood. And with that starting point, uh, we are developing a, a fair amount of different projects. Also, that the Danish Art Foundation, uh, they, they came into this project with a, a fairly big um, support uh, this early spring. Which is uh, inspiring, of course, that it's not only us who think this is important, so also colleagues think that's important. Well, right now it's definitely the house in, in, in Canada, but you know, through my career I have done a lot of different projects, also be part of very big infrastructural projects, but uh, with this company right now, I would say they're, they're Canadian. And it's quite interesting that these small projects, they, they can create such a great attention. And you know, in these days where with the Zomi, stuff you come around the world in five minutes and we get positive reaction from places where you think how oh, <laughs> where does that come from but also that's uh, small summers we did it for Danish in, in Denmark very well known environmental um, uh, journalist is called Sina Benebe and she, she, she make a living of communication about sustainability and, and building so of course because of that we we come around, but that's some years ago now. Some of the biggest changes in the industry is the concern of, about sustainability. I mean, 10 years ago, it was you could promote yourself as, as a sustainable architect, but you cannot go to an architect and say, I'm not interested in sustainability. So you don't have that as a specific trademark. It's just the way that you interpret what is sustainability for your business. So this is a, 
a change, but that's kind of change for the whole world right now. And another thing, we can promote ourselves in another way. Ten years ago, the Soul Me industry was not that big. And I used to be an uh, editor for Architectural Magazine, I think, recently, more than ten years ago. And, you know, we, we, we got a little bit of promotion from Saha, Did and uh, Norman Foster, that's it. But now, these are days you can, uh, in fact, promote your work and discuss your work and your opinion, your architectural opinion with people all over the world. And for this, we are a fairly small business, but we get um, in contact with clients from yeah, I would say all over the world, I mean, from very different places. Also because I think Danish architecture have uh, these, for the last five, ten years, uh, they, they gone abroad. Before that, you know, we had Jan Utsen in, in, in Sydney, but, but with, with Big and Bjarke Engels. And, and, and now we have a lot of offices, big offices, who are, have big business around the world. And that's definitely also a trade-off for our business as well. Well, you could say they are the technical challenges, but that's, that's fairly boring to talk about. But, but what we do, we, like in Canada, we, we work closely with, uh, in this case, it was an, uh, the, uh, the engineer who have, um, you know, all the, the, the rules uh, over there to get a building permission. But I think when they come to, to a Danish architect, they have a very positive attitude towards that and, and like to hear what is your interpretation about sustainable architecture. So I, I think that all the challenges are in, in, in a very positive way, I think, because when you, 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 you go for, for an architect, you've already gone far and then you, you, go, you see, from my point of view, you present yourself as a, a very a client with a great amount of curiosity when it comes to architecture because otherwise you could just pick a local one now you have a you want something more something different Yeah, communication, yeah, the thing is also, that, of course, a big uh, change for the industry is also the communication with the emails and all this stuff that you've probably heard about called the internet. It makes everything so much easier. For instance, um, when we did that project in Canada, there was this time difference, eight hours, and that means when they get up, we went to bed and so on. So when they gave us a question, we, they had the answer in the morning. So in fact, it was, uh, you can say in that sense, it was more easier to, uh, to work with this uh, time difference. And also, you know, with this small video camera and you can just sketch and you can film it while you're sketching and talking. And so it's very, in that sense, it's very fluent actually. But you know, you've got the whole thing in your, 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 your digital squish knife called the smartphone these days. So for me, it's, it's a matter of keep it simple, you know, and, and, and you can just actually put the camera on and, and, and uh, it's a live video and you've got it in Messenger or you've got it in Dropbox or you've got it in Google Drive. And uh, so, so, I mean, you can... Again, it's gone so fast, everyone knows this, but you know, before this, you, you need to create a, a certain uh, video conference environmental, but it's not like this, it's, it's a, a much more hands-on thing. And also you can just sketch on the drawing, take a picture, mail it uh, straight away and, and they got it. So everything has become so much easier and therefore so much more joyful to be an architect. Uh, I mean, from 10 years to now, but also when I was graduated for, oh, that must be 200 years ago now, but <laughs> everything has changed in a positive sense, I think. Uh, it, it, I think it's probably the same answers for, for most, it's, it's, a, it's networking. It has been mainly networking, but now because of this 
so many possibilities. You, as I mentioned, you get in contact with other people in another way. So people have seen just a fragment of a house and they were investigating it. Oh, that, I, I did a summer house, by the way, from an international known photographer called Didiza. She worked with very big, famous clients and uh, she was promoted on this uh, within Pathro's uh, homepage because she's doing photos for her um, homepage. And I did a small studio and that was in there and the studio was like 20 square meters, but uh, 20 square meters came around the world and, and, and people would say, oh, we've got that Scandinavian atmosphere. So I got in contact with people from the States, for instance, on that one. And that, that, that's a new thing. It's word of mouth, but also now I would say it become close to 50-50 with so many, I mean, people see it on Instagram, Facebook, Pinterest and stuff like that. But I have to me, admit that we are not very strategic about it so far. And I say that because I used to be an editor in a magazine, so I have a lot of opinion about that too. I offer that to my colleagues or whoever like to listen, but I don't take my own medicine <laughs> so far. <laughs> No, of course. Yeah. When, it, when it comes to create a situation, a position for yourself and your company where you can attract the clients that you like to attract, you can uh, never say it's enough. <laughs> so, so, and definitely not word by mouth. I mean, when I was graduated, you could not, uh, it was illegal to promote yourself as an architect. <laughs> but now you have to do it and people become more and more professional about that. Now you have to, to, to be more strategically precise about what kind of clients would you want to attract and how do you want to attract them. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's not realistic to, to say it's just word by mouth. Yeah, that, that, that's challenging, that's challenging um, because now we, for the last years we, it's been, been private clients, very nice clients, but it, they are also challenging for a professional business because they are not concerned as professional clients and uh, so therefore it's important to definitely have a mix of professional clients and pro non-professional clients and to make that move, it, it takes a while, you know, the, the, the building industry is a slow business. I mean, from the first meeting to have a house, the very fast is two or three years and normally it go, goes even faster. You know, it's a fairly complicated and it's about it's something about millions, you know. Whether it's a summer house, it's also about what, one, two, three million for a summer house or bigger project is 30 million and it's, it's complex so it takes a long time uh, or to have a project that you can refer to as oh we're also doing this yeah. a, a non-professional is a private client who have to build for, for him or herself typically uh, it's, a, it's a domestic house a summer house or like the villa in Canada and a professional client, it, it can be, well, for instance, we're doing a Wardog Steiner school now, or we're starting out in that process. We concern them as professional, those we collaborate with, uh, because they have experience in, in building and they know all the processes and things like that. And they have an idea about the complexity and about the, the structure of the fee, which is challenging when not professional clients to explain the fee structure. How come you need that kind of money to make one drawing? But you know what I mean? It's just you not know, to make one drawing, you need to make 10 more drawings and so on. We are in a process. We, we, we like to, to, to have a better balance because now it's, it's private clients, as I described, and uh, we have to create a new balance, but we are in a process with that. But I'm not sure that 
the industry, or if we talk about architectural offices, that they are that slow because it's, it, we just follow the, the, the society in general and it's uh, this speeding process. Years ago, it took a long time to adapt into Archicad or AutoCAD, but now all the, 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 the software tools become more easy. I think the industry is moving fairly fast, as fast as you can expect. I mean, for instance, like a program like SketchUp, it's very easy to learn and people pick up the 3D tools very fast comparing to when I was a student. I mean, so I think people do it as fast as possible. But the thing is the platform, how to communicate with other offices platform and that also need clients and engineers, especially when we talk about bigger projects. And that, that, that is one of the challenges. Well, I, I, I think we have to, to see the, the, the CAD CAM technology that we have known for a long time, which means you send a file to a workshop or, or something like that, and then, then they cut the things or they build the thing. I think we would see this kind of 3D printing in, 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 in bigger scale that, that might come into the building industry. We just now seen some kind of sci-fi examples of how to machine are uh, laying the bricks uh, building the concrete but just like in the small scale 3d printing we will go in that direction uh, but the, uh, very interesting could we see any kind of disruption in the architectural business where where people come in like we have seen in the video store business for instance i don't know but it's interesting if you just uh, with this artificial intelligence if you just give a lot of information and you, you say beautiful house, whoop, here comes a beautiful house. You, we don't need an architect. Could happen, but I can't see how, but it could happen. The reason I can't is because I don't want to see it. <laughs> it's a, it's a light. Yeah, as I said today, this is this global con consensus about we have to change it. So everyone has to chip in with an idea about new materials that have to be used in, in circles, you know, we cannot produce throw away, produce throw away. <laughs> so it has to be um, circular uh, consumption of uh, resources and everyone has to chip in. I mean, right now we are doing wood, but this is very simple to understand the wood. You could just leave the house and it will go back to nature, but we, we cannot, we can, we have to use new kind of materials, new bioplastic materials. And that's, 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 that's going to be interesting to see. And also because we have used too much plastic in, in the building industry. I mean, we have the, the table we're sitting here is like a plastic surface. We, we can't feel anything. The, the chairs is made, made of plastic. There's, there's no uh, sensitivity towards uh, surfaces and materials. We have to go back to nature in that sense. I, I, I see that the 3D tools that we use, they become more and more easy to use and more and more, uh, what do you say, more playful. And uh, so very soon I think we would see where we use our hands with a VR camera to build the houses and go around them and actually have a connection to a big 3D printer. I mean, we have all these things, they are there now, but they will just be developed in a way that they work faster and cheaper so we, we, it's, everyone can get hands on the 3D printer and but the thing is we, we, when I talk 3D I talk one-to-one -one 3D printer that would, that, would, that would change the industry I think also maybe maybe an architect would have a role where we just make the rules like if you play Monopoly for instance there's one guy who just develop the, the, the rules about how to play Monopoly, but what you do, it would be individual, it's like, if you just do like this or this, you would have a 
beautiful piece of architecture, uh, but we're not designing all the details, we're just creating the rules. Because now people can, you know, with the 3D tools, you, know, you can do the, themselves. If you go to an IKEA store, for instance, you can design your kitchen in the 3D tool. I mean, a five-year-old kid can do it from all this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For, for instance, tra the transportation of building materials is quite costly. And if you go to a building site, all the waste of these, it's enormous. And we have to change that. So we also have to develop new local building materials. Now we import from all over the world. Now I'm talking about Denmark, but that happened all other places as well. That had to be changed. And, um, and that will change. It depends on the complexity of the task. I mean, first, the first meeting we have to agree on what is the task, or what, what to do. And before that, we cannot make a contract or agreement. We just have this meeting about this new school, and there is a bit amount of complexity in this one about the economy, budget, and when. And, the authorities and it's gone and it's a very interesting project by the way <laughs> a sustainable old wood barns here in uh, Copenhagen uh, with uh, Årstiderne which is a, a fairly interesting food producing company so that would take a while I think some months in the for instance the house in Canada we, we just but he was a private client but he was very efficient to make things happen so he and he's a, a successful businessman he he uh, are very good at, at make things happen and make it happen fast. So we just made the agreement here on, on the table and then we started. For me, it's, it's very simple uh, and it's just a, we just need to talk and <laughs> discuss things. Uh, you need this and this and this and you know none, none of us have the, the answers at, with the first meetings. They come with, with the, the answers they think and then I come with new questions and then it's um, quite normal that they change their mind. Oh yeah, that's right, maybe we could do it outside as well. Wow, good idea, we have to think about that and then go back to the other people that are involved in the project. So, I, and I know some colleagues, they, they, they have very complex strategy is about that, how to involve the client, but I mean, it's not that complex thing from my point of view. Architecture is about creating the physical environmental for the life we like to live. So therefore, architecture is humanistic discipline more than aesthetic discipline. And therefore, the most important tool as an architect is empathy.